Hello and welcome to Naive and Dangerous, a podcast about emergent media brought to you by two media researchers. My name is Ted and you can find me on Twitter at Ted Mitu, that's T-E-D-M-I-T-E-W. And my name is Chris Moore and you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore Moore. So in starting our discussion of uh, the cyborg is a problem, uh, there are several issues that emerge. First, is, is Is the cyborg a problem and why? And so let's start there. And clearly it was a problem for us because we couldn't figure out a title. And we came up with three titles and uh, we decided that uh, um, we might as well just figure out what the title is in the opening of the podcast. So our first title was by uh, Donna Haraway, uh, who is uh, uh, um, at this stage probably already legendary. Uh, a philosopher of technology, media researcher, uh, feminist scholar, and uh, the title that uh, we have from her is uh, this expression, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. Uh, the second title comes from uh, Alita, from uh, Alita Battle Angel, so the char- character of Alita who is a cyborg, um, and uh, Alita says, does it bother you that I am not completely human? And the third title that we came up with is a phrase, a line from Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, by Major Motoko Kusanagi, who is the main protagonist of Ghost in the Shell. So, uh, uh, if you recall in that, uh, uh, in that movie, um, I mean, I'm not going to give the, uh, any big spoilers, but part of the plotline involves uh, these uh, sex dolls, in effect, who are trying to escape from their condition. And so Major Motoko says, if the dolls also had voices, they would have screamed, I didn't want to become human. So this is our opening. What do you think, Chris? Which title is, is the best and why? It's super hard to pick because all three of them create uh, different conditions under which we imagine the cyborg and they create them in different ways. Um, as you were saying, you know, Haraway sets up a, a binary opposition and then chooses which side of that binary that she that she wants to be. But I think she's also playing on, you know, feminist literature in the seventies and eighties, and the, the the notion of idolizing women as as goddesses, um, and and viewing the cyborg as a much more radical figure um, when it comes to thinking about humanity. Um, in her mind, you know, the cyborg is a survivor, the cyborg is an outsider, the cyborg is a hybrid organism, and it's not definable by uh, its biological capacities. And so that, that kind of interests me. But um, moving on to the Alita Battle Angel, which I think is possibly, I'm, I'm, I'm closest to this one, I think, as, as, the, as the real title for the episode. Does it bother you that I'm not completely human? But this, this worries me in a little bit because I, I, I don't think of a cyborg as something less than human. See, that's, this is really interesting because uh, from Alita's perspective, when Alita is asking this question, See, it, it's, it's fascinating because it, the question doesn't indicate that she thinks of herself as less, a lesser being or, or, or lesser human. All she says is, you know, out of love for her human uh, uh, partner in, in the movie, does it bother you that I'm not exactly like you? In effect, that's what she's asking. I don't think it indicates that she's uh, somehow... Um, thinking uh, uh, less of herself because of that. Do you? I, I read the word completely a bit differently. I, I, I take away from that the implication that she is not, that she is somehow an incomplete, uh, incomplete human. human. Yeah. And I worry about it because I, I like the movie and I like the manga, but I really dislike the uh, relationship in that movie and the relationship um, with the with the male character in that movie, yeah, I yeah. find it really detracts from her story, 
and um, it's it, it's the idea that 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 she is somehow lesser human because he the the male figure in that in that movie is is, is like a pure human. Yeah, I, he's not augmented. I think the writers used him as a mirror. They needed uh, a narrative tool basically in the script which would allow the protagonist, which is a little, to uh, experience her dramatic journey. Yeah. Right. So because the character has to experience some sort of dramatic journey and change in the movie, otherwise it's a bad movie. So what's happening here is that the, I think they decided to go for a shortcut and to write a mirror into the script, which will allow the character to develop herself and experience uh, some sort of dramatic alteration. I, I do agree. And, and another way to think about particularly the, the, the male love interest in the story is to look at how he is actually a cyborg. They play a lot of attention to the monocycle that he rides. Mm. Right, so and we're going straight into Marshall McLuhan here, and the the technology as the extension of the human, and so he's his whole mode of transport, his whole sense of agency in that world is connected to his ability to to, to transport but on that motorcycle. Can I just yes? And can I let me let me finish <laughs> because oh damn it, I forgot the email because one of the things that make that endears Alita later is the roller feet hmm. that she gets and so there's a nice juxtaposition there between both those characters another element is of course he wears leather jacket he wears a zipper right this is this is this is a cyborg function as well clothes are a cyborg technology that we extend our skin yeah we're moving into McClellan but yeah before we go there this is interesting because I think a mistake that uh, uh, Haraway makes is kind of exemplified in, in this uh, problem that appears here with this notion of not completely human. Yeah. Because there is an assumption, and it's, it's, it's excusable, of course, that humanity is the pinnacle of being. Whereas not completely human could just as easily stand, I am much higher in the chain of existence than you. Does it bother you that I am not completely like you? Right? Uh, it, it's not a linear... Uh, or, or if you imagine it as a linear development, the human humanness, right, being human, does not necessarily mean being at the end point of development. I think this is a much better reading of the term completely, and and I, and I actually think you're right there. I think that that Alita is is not not superior isn't the word, but she's beyond beyond yeah. human. That she's most definitely human and completely human, but she's also something else yes and 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 rather than feeling incomplete she is she is worried that he is concerned that he doesn't meet her more advanced level yeah or, or is incapable of being uh, uh at, at such level of otherness and of of uh, operating in this level of multiplicity that she is and this kind of leads me to the final title that, uh, that we have here, this notion of if the dolls also had voices, they would have screamed, I didn't want to become human. Because you could read this as, uh, uh, and, and in fact, this is probably the most uh, um, aggressive title and the most uh, kind of revealing of a different position. Because here you have uh, the machine intelligence uh, reacting in horror to... to that aspect of being human, right, in which they, they act, they operate in sex dolls, basically. Yeah. And this is a, a, a reaction in horror to this. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is where, where it becomes really interesting. And so I was thinking, I, I think we, we might end up unpacking this for the rest uh, of the podcast while we're thinking about what does it mean to be a cyborg and, in effect, what does it mean to be, to be human. human. So, so this wording of become human... Um, uh, Kusanagi in the first movie goes through a, a, a transition in which she merges with an AI and becomes something beyond both AI and cyborg. She's no like she's something else, uh, and and is and so is this is this a reference to that in this movie that that she's worried that she will that humanity is almost kind of less than what she is. And so she's worried that she will become human and thereby be something less than, than what she is as a cyborg? I think 
I mean, this is open for interpretation, of course, but I think that she's comfortable with who she is in that new role. She becomes, in effect, in the, in, uh, the, the first ghost in the shell ends with her basically uh, transcending. She acquires in, in, uh, the metaphorical ascension protocols and just mm-hmm. moves into the matrix, right? Uh, but the second movie has her as a sort of omnipresent sentience. Yes. You mentioned that she was the protagonist in that movie, but another protagonist in that movie is Bato. Yes, and that's an interesting uh, um, qualifier here. And Bato is a, is a continuation of the character from the first film. He is an agent for Section 6, I think he still is at that point. He is an advanced cyborg. He has a cyborg body, a cyborg eyes, but he still retains a biological brain that's encased and in a shell. he has a cyborg dog. Uh, yeah, the, it's a, it's a, <laughs> what breed is the dog? I forget now. Uh, it's like a... I don't know what they're called. The one with the long ears. Big, long ears. It's yeah. like a Snoopy dog. Like, oh, gosh, I should know what that is. And it's a, it's a cyborg. But this is a reference to um, Philip K. Dick's um, uh, Do Androids yes, Dream yeah, of Electric yeah, Sheep? Yeah. And it's a and it's this constant question about are we really dealing with androids or are we really dealing with cyborgs? And what is the difference? Mm. I mean, my if my argument about you know humans already being a cyborg is that we already are ex- expand our senses through through different technologies, can we be a cyborg without any biological elements? I mean, is that, and that's what an android. Yeah, you're talking about uh, without any biological elements in the sense that without what we construe as a body. What what the cyberpunks would call the meat. Yeah, so. Uh, the wetware. Yeah. Uh, can can we be a cyborg? Okay, let's let's take a step back. Because now we have to take a step back. Yeah, so, <laughs> as you might have guessed, we're talking about cyborgs this week. Yeah. And uh, because we're media researchers, we're 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 really dealing with the way in which the cyborg has been represented in popular fiction. And I mean, we we started with uh, Haraway, um, but we immediately moved into uh, Alita: Battle Angel, which is the James Cameron and um, who's the director? Uh, yeah, Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, um, Ghost in the Shell. Um, let's take a step back. So, yep. the, first, what does cyborg mean? Right. Good so question. Cyborg comes from a cybernetic organism. Uh, came out as a concept in 1960 uh, by Man- Manfred Kleins and Nathan Klein. Um, and they were thinking about uh, space exploration, space colonization. And uh, and then the, the phrase stuck, right? so, the notion of a cybernetic organism. But, and look, I'll give a bit more context there because I love this paper of theirs, right? So they're like, okay, space exploration, right? It does not make any sense to recreate the conditions of Earth in space. You are, you are trying to create a precious bubble in space that could be popped instantly and humans are not meant to be in space and they will die instantly. So how do we do that? We instead re-engineer humanity. Humans, yeah, you will augment humans. Yeah. We, we re-engineer them genetically. We re-engineer them um, technologically. And suddenly you have a, a new level of humanity that can exist in the vacuum of space. That, that They laugh at cosmic radiation. They don't need you know, oxygen supplies to breathe. And then suddenly you've got this new frontier uh, for space exploration, they, you know, and this is the, this is where the cyborg is really interesting because it's saying, is this a new race? Is this a new? Is this a, a, a new level of evolution of humankind, or is it, as McLuhan would say, an extension of humanity? Moving to McLuhan, then let's let's just dive there because there is a there are two possible readings, uh, because McLuhan's argument is, of course, always that. Uh, uh, media and technologies are uh, variation of media are uh, extensions of ourselves, of our bodies and agency, right? Uh, an extension of ourselves does not only mean an extension of the body, it's also agency. And in fact, it's primarily agency, the body second. So in that context, a hammer is an extension, extension of agency. Um, and uh, so clothes, glasses, etc. But then again, so this would, if you were to limit yourself only to this kind of reading of what a cybernet, cybernetic organism and, and or a cyborg is, then you would presume that, yes, we are all cyborgs uh, because we are all using 
uh, a plethora of uh, extensions of agency. And have done in perpetuity. And, and in fact, this is what makes us human, right? Uh, the, you, you couldn't argue in any other way. Uh, so this, this is uh, also automatically dealing away with the entire subsection of, uh, I, I, I'm quite radical here, I think it's pseudo-philosophy, this idea of technological determinism, of technological versus social, etc., etc. It's a, it's, it's a pseudo-problem because we've always been technological. Right? We, we couldn't call ourselves human if we were to abstract technology and, and extend, any extension of agency from that. However, there is an interesting problem here because McLuhan, again, would also insist that the medium is the message. And any change in the medium is a change in the message. So the more you add, uh, the more mediation, the more you modulate, the more you extend agency, the more you shift supplement in one way or another agency, the more changes you effectuate. Until uh, down the track, you're looking at a dramatic difference between someone who, let's say, operates at the level of technology of uh, uh, late 20th century uh, Western country as we are today, uh, and uh, um, minus some advancements in the internet, of course, and someone who is uh, operating at the level of, uh, let's say, um, science fiction, such as a little battle angel. I really like the way you use the word modulation there, because it, it reminds me of, you know, when you would modulate a sound bite or a, or a sound wave. When you modulate it, you pass it through filters and you change the pitch, you change the tempo, whatever. You're still working on the original, but you are also creating something new. And so the more you modulate, the, the more new, the more radically different it is to the original. And I think that is an interesting way to think about the cyborg as a kind of modulation with a degree of intensity of that modulation. And then that, and you can then think about that in terms of the relationship to the, the what we might call the baseline sample of, of, of humanity. But you've also got evolution in the mix as well. When if we, we you know where do we, we've got to start drawing the line somewhere. Where do we draw the line at hu- human? And do we need to draw the line? Yeah, the like, like well, this is like this problem of of naming, right? It's a taxonomy problem. So you are organizing, you're thinking about reality, and we have to you have to name things. So when. When do you stop naming someone human and start naming them something else, a cyborg? Right? This is what we're asking here. It is, and that implies, you know, as you say, agency, but it also implies hierarchies of power. Who has the right to name? Who decides what the name is? Who decides where the, the board borders are? This is the. I mean, this this question actually popped up in the in the BCM three two five feed this week. You know, with regards to replicants in Blade Runner. Mm. You know. The replicants are an interesting uh, technology because they're biological. They replicants in Blade Runner seem to, to all intents and purposes, to be human. Yeah, they, have, they have human form. They're augmented humans. That's it. Yeah. So augmented. Yeah. Now that's a, that's a nice word as well, right? So, but in in that universe, they they're less than human, or and as Terrell says, more than human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're enslaved. So, so humanity has been able to create a subsect of humanity that doesn't get the term, doesn't get the term human. It's a replicant. It's a copy. How is the Tyrell line? Tyrell has this line in the first Blade Runner: "A light that br- that uh, burns twice as bright uh, burns twice as, as fast. fast." Yeah. So they they burn twice as bright. Right? They uh, their powers are uh, substantially increase the physical. Mental uh, response time, yeah, response time, reflexes uh, compared to human, but at the cost of limiting them to seven years. So, four years. Was it four? I think it's four. Isn't okay, it? maybe it's four. Maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure. For some reason, I remember seven. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, but again, it, the time timeline is limited. Um, just as ours is limited, hundred and twenty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even that—that's that's pretty good, right? <laughs> I think I don't think the average is anywhere near that. What like the average for for males is what seventy eight or something? Yeah, it depends on. It, where. And yeah, in the developed world, exactly. So I mean, the replicant is um, a modulation of of the human, and it, it's it's an increase in tempo and it's an increase in in, in abilities. 
So check this out. So we can either, we, we have two options here at this stage. This is a bifurcation. We can either choose to say something like, we are all human. We are just, there, there is just augmentation. Just like you will not say that someone with a prosthesis is not human anymore. Right? So if you were to agree that someone wearing glasses is still human, or someone wearing a prosthetic hand is still human, then uh, you you cannot at that moment prescribe uh, some sort of artificial uh, synthetic boundary where you stop being human. Mm. Um, I mean, it's illogical then. It becomes uh, a question of power, right? Someone would someone decides. Or alternatively, you could make an argument that you have, which was, would you would imagine is a Nazi sort of argument that you have pure humans, right? Non augmented in any way, and everyone else. Can you can you see any other options? This is very difficult territory, and and I and I I go to. I mean, this is very dangerous territory as well. So I'm, I'm going to have to tread carefully here. Yes. Um, so there is there is a field of thought, um, and uh, it's not incredibly popular, but there, there is this, there's this field of thought about autism, and the increased rates of autism. And one of the theories is that this is a sign of evolution in process. Yeah, there's, that the, there's a number of science fiction movies on this topic. Yeah, that the, the human brain is experimenting via various mutations in order to deal with the enormous increase in the sensory and stimulus that is being applied to the human in the, in the contemporary yeah. moment. And the, these, the, 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 the autism, and remember this is a spectrum. Like this, yeah. this autism is, is not a, a, a disease. It's not a condition. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a spectrum of existence. And so, I mean, I think we need to apply that kind of logic to, yeah. to thinking about cyborg. A cyborg isn't a thing. A cyborg is a, a spectrum of existence in which you can plot. So this the, will be a variation of that first idea that we have humanity in all its infinite richness and as part of that is the spectrum of c- cyborgness yes yes right? of, of cybernetic augmentation of human of uh, the human form augmentation is 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 a is a is a funny word um you know like when you say when, when a pro- when you think about a prosthesis i would definitely agree that it's an augmentation like it, it's you know uh, when when you watch um uh, when you watch athletes at the mm. the Paralympics and they have those amazing yes the, uh, leg prostheses that help them spring actually uh, yeah uh, I was, it, yes it very much reminds me of a litter. yes yes yeah and I would definitely call that augmented they are running faster than than you know pure bi- bi- biological and no, pure is a stupid word uh, but but but. It's not, it's not a stupid unaugmented. word, un- unaugmented, right, or without or absent that augmentation. Yeah. But I'm using it on purpose because uh, you, would, you would think that uh, there is um, some sort of level of pure, right, which is without. But, like, the first thing, think of glasses, yeah. right? So glasses appeared in Europe in the 14th century, around the, the early 1300s, Right. In, in monasteries? Yes. yes. And when they appeared in monasteries first, they were considered as a, like something on the boundary between the work of the devil and or something which might most likely be prohibited or on the wrong side of uh, um, you know, the, the Holy Fathers. Right? Because in, in the church throughout medieval times was always organized around uh, the authority of the Holy Fathers of the uh, the early days of the church. So, uh, if you couldn't find any uh, excuse for wearing glasses in St. Augustine, most likely you shouldn't be wearing glasses because they are from the devil. So, again, and, and you know, through practice, of course, they became normalized. But uh, uh, are they on augmentation? Yes, they are. Just like when you're using a cane uh, to walk. Is but, this an augmentation? But but to but in order to need them, you are not. I mean, are you pure? Even though you are, 
My point is that there is no pure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I think we were both hovering around the same point. Yeah, absolutely. Cain, okay, right? So yeah, this is a, this is a, a, an extension of uh, balance. So this is an extension of uh, a, a cor- well, it's an, a, it's a correction. Yes, but notice uh, when I say augmentation, I use it on purpose here because it changes us. Absolutely. That is the tool, point. Tool, we create yes. tools. And they and change then, us. And then tools change us. They create us into something new. So when you, so all we have in effect is a spectrum. I, I like your word. So we have, all we have is a spectrum of humanity. Yes. In its uh, augmentedness. Beautiful. And, and so let's think of a taxonomy for, for this spectrum. Yeah, right. And we can draw on, we can draw on yeah. popular representations, right? Yeah, uh, I was uh, thinking of one. So... Popular representations in culture. So I was thinking, you know, I, I keep thinking lately about uh, this notion of the assembly line, also because I was teaching this the other week uh, in my class in first year, but um, in BCM 112. One, two. Yeah, so I was thinking about uh, the assembly line and how the assembly line altered fundamentally uh, humanity. Mm. And it's, it's scary when you think about it because we kind of avoid thinking about this. And I was showing in class, uh, in, in my lecture, a fragment of Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. And he really illustrates this very well, like through the comic form, of course, but he illustrates to what extent the assembly line uh, radically reformats humans, right, in their behavior. Because, in effect, humans are forced to, pro- to perform machinic uh, behavior. Yeah. Just in, the, in, the, in a mirror image of the... Uh, dolls that uh, Major Mokoto is talking about when she's saying that they don't want to be human. Right? It, it also removes the agency from that machinic yeah. behavior. Like you could talk about the blacksmith yeah. hammering as machinic, right? Yes, yes. But yeah. but but they've got control over what they're mm. shaping and what they're yeah. doing. The 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 fact the factory line, the production line, totally dehumanizes, t- removes the agency. And, and incorporates the human as a cog in that system. This is the metaphor in Metropolis. Yeah. But you know what I was talking about earlier when I was teaching was the classic Lucille Ball sketch, the black and white sketch, where she's working at the chocolate factory. And she has she's supposed to wrap the chocolates and the, and the production line coming out and the first couple of chocolates she's she's wrapping yeah, fine exactly, yeah. but then the then the production line gets faster and so she's scrabbling to wrap the chocolates so she doesn't know what to do because all the chocolates are piling up so she shoves them in her mouth <laughs> right? and, and then she's got a mouthful of chocolates and she's still it's still getting faster so she's shoveling them down the top like <laughs> but it, and it's and it's 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 you know it's kind of. And, and the, what I love most about that is that Lucy's aid, uh, agency, her humanness, totally breaks down the, the production line. <laughs> yeah, you have this uh, uh, it isn't in human logic. Absolutely. Right? It isn't in human logic because it's so abstracted and this is an interesting thing. So this is where the cyborg probably has the, this is probably our final kind of boundary of the spectrum is where agency becomes so abstracted and looped into itself that Anyone which participates is, is completely uh, rendered uh, uh, powerless, right? So you, you become a cog, an extension. And this reminds me, uh, I was thinking this morning about uh, the word, because I was thinking about cyborgs, right? And I was thinking about the word robot. You know where robot came from? It came from Karel Chapek, from, yes. uh, from a Czech writer. Uh, a play? Yes. And it is a uh, robot in, in Czech, it's in, in all Slavic languages for that matter, it comes from robota, which means work. Yeah. Right? So, a, a robot is a worker. A and perfect so, worker. Yes, a being which is defined only by the fact that it works. And doesn't right? do anything else. Nothing else. Yeah. Right? It, there's nothing else to it. Only yeah. that. Right? It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't take time out. It doesn't relax. It doesn't, it doesn't it, enjoy a lot. It doesn't have a life because it only has work. Yes. So, it's pure abstracted agency yeah. uh, prescribed from any, any uh, transgression. So, it cannot transgress. And this, this is pure horror. Yes, this is pure. Yes. It's it's totally without agency, and I, I this connects back to our last episode, right? With AI, I think this is where this fear of AI comes from mm. because they are they are caught in the machine perpetually, and and this is also uh, occurs to our, our our fear of cyborgs is that we are afraid that our augmentation of humanity leads us to machinic like qualities and traps us. As, as beings of the machine rather than the machine being human. 
Um, this is a lot of people have a, have a lot of anxieties around the idea of implanting chips in the brain. Um, you know, naive and dangerous. I'm quite excited about the idea of having a, a Wi-Fi chip in my head with an overlay of the internet on my eyeballs, or, or just streaming whatever content I want, or pure VCR, uh, v- VCR, uh, uh, VR. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm quite excited by that idea. But people view that right as a as an avenue of command and control that someone can take control of your nervous system via via your implant, and thereby making you that cog in the machine. Um, uh, this actually happens. This happens. This is part of the plot in Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the, the Shell, Shell uh, the Borg, uh, mm. Cyberman in Doctor Who. These are all these are all cyborgs who lose their humanity because of their proximity to the technological realm of this that's, that's connected to the logic of the production line and the horror of losing that agency over the self. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we already hit Cyberman there. We already hit the Borg. The Borg is really interesting. Mm. Like the Borg is this... Is this? It, it's this so. There's so much in the Borg, right? It's this fear of socialism. It's this fear of communism. Because the Borg is a collective. It is a super being, but it does not give you the choice to join. Everyone must join. And everyone is completely disempowered. In in the in fact, more than that, everyone is de-identified. Uh, yes. Well, they have numbers, but but their only their identity is part of the collective. So it's one of Ten thousand. Yes, there is no. See, by identity, I mean here not uh, uh, that which is represented by a number, because this is an identity is understood by a database, yeah. right? But that which cannot be quantified, right? An identity by definition cannot be, should not be able to be quantified in any way, right? It should always overflow. Then you know. It, see, well, this is an interesting definition of a human. The human overflows. Uh, the the assembly line behaves like an assembly line, right? So in a human, the overflows are a feature. In an assembly line, they are a bug, right? Something is wrong. Uh, something's falling apart. So when you have a cybernetic organism which has moved to on the spectrum to the extent where there's no overflows there, they've stopped being human. Human. That's, yes. There you go. Whereas... They're, in, and they're a robot. Yeah, they're, they're pure robot, right? Uh in fact, Alexa is more human than that because Alexa glitches. Yes, and overflows. overflows. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's, Siri is the same. Yeah. She'll pop up and say, you know, at, at odd times in the middle of lectures and yeah. things like that. And I'm like, no, Siri, sorry. You're <laughs> you know. <laughs> but this is, a, see, the glitch is an example of an overflow, right? Where you have uh, something that happens that shouldn't be happening. Um, uh, we have a Google Home at, at, at home, and, and she, uh, I, I, I gender her automatically. Uh, let's have fun. We'll go with that. She, she just will mishear us because of our Australian accents don't quite pick up, and, and so but she'll come up with these amazing things that we didn't intend to search for, mm-hmm. and suddenly we're going down this rabbit hole of, of weird stuff that Google has has popped up and shared with us. Google, yeah, she, Google has become part of our lives. <laughs> they, 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 I, we're on a tangent now, but the amount of homework that my kids get done with Google's help. Yeah, yeah, just ask. Right? Just, just ask is just. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, I'm sure her teachers are horrified, but I think it's just, just brilliant. Um, In fact, I mean, I'm quite radical here. I think uh, teachers sh- should be horrified uh, because they can be so easily substituted. And in fact, they are being substituted. And uh, the kind of teacher that uh, probably we're looking at another few years down the track of the evolution of Alexa and uh, Google Home, this kind of massively, uh, uh, massive uh, uh, data set backed uh, AI, um, the kind of uh, future that they portend in terms of teaching is uh, it's just uh, amazing. It's uh, the production line. Yeah. It's it's the and that's why people find it horrific because it's it's the total removal of the the teacher as the agent in that situation and are replaced with an AI. The only thing that I find um, 
troubling about that is, you know, one of the nicest things about teaching is is the tangents that arise in the in the. But you in, see, in, tangents come in university. Yeah, yeah. Right. They don't come in. At they, high you don't have tangents yeah. in primary school. The primary school and high school are all about preparing to this day unbelievable as it is preparing students for the assembly line yeah and tangents are to be yeah, they are bug. expunged tangents yeah. are a bug yeah right? absolutely in you know, the how, discipline problems yeah how, how dare you think about something else <laughs> yeah? like how dare you have ideas about stuff that is not in my teacher's uh, instruction manual about what should we cover today <laughs> right isn't it yeah yeah and, uh, and so prescribed 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 so schools are an assembly line and one of the problems and again I'm rambling now but one of the problems that we have as uh, university uh, lecturers is that when uh, when we're dealing with students coming directly from high school we're dealing with people who have been formatted for 12 years of their lives to to operate on an assembly line, and one of the first things we're telling them is, "Don't forget about the assembly line, right?" And uh, the world that uh, is uh, all around us, and for, in, in which you need to be operating, is anything but, right? Um, and besides, the assembly line is evil. So, oh, and that's, that's, and that's so terrifying for students. It's terrifying because not only do they have to rediscover the sense of agency that has been has been suffocated. Um, the, the, the worry that then comes, and this is where I think a lot of student anxieties come from, is, is how to regain that. How to regain that agency while well, at the same time preparing themselves for a world that demands a certain type of labor in, in, the, in the workplace. I think something else, and this is actually very, very much related to cyborgs. Um, mm. We are not on a tangent at all. No. So if you are wondering why we're we talking about students, we are not on a tangent. It's related to cyborgs, as you will discover. Um, one of the problems I think here is that uh, um, like it might be a presumption on my part. Maybe you will disagree. Let's see. I presume that students always have agency mm. um, because they're human, right? And they have been formatted into thinking and operating as if they don't have agency. Absolutely. And over time, to a repetitive uh, trauma, which basically, in my opinion, school is repetitive trauma over 12 years. Uh, over time, they have been taught, and those that have learned to excel in, in this uh, in human environment have uh, basically perfected uh, the art of suppressing their own agency uh, subconsciously and looking for an authority figure who will instruct on the steps to follow. And this is, this is why some disciplines at university level, you know, uh, are fine, you know, for this model. You know, the you know there are some there are some degrees and some disciplines, right? Who 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 continue this formatting and and churn out graduates that are neatly stamped into the type of graduate that the industry is is, is looking to employ, and and it's not a problem for them. And this is this is interesting also because you know the the for for whatever reason. Few people know about this, and uh, even people who should know about this. Uh, the modern education system, as we know it, right? primary school, secondary school, university, was invented in the beginning of the 19th century in Prussia, right? By the Prussian state, which was the most totalitarian state at that time on the planet. Uh, it was uh, basically the laughing stock of the rest of Europe uh, in terms of how absurdly totalitarian it was. And so they were the first to invent uh, compulsory schooling in this form, with the express uh, and uh, uh, explicit uh, purpose to uh, create as soon as possible generations of obedient uh, uh, bureaucracy workers and assembly line workers for the uh, rise of the Industrial Revolution in, uh, and the assembly line in Prussia, in Germany. And they succeeded. I mean, they, create, they did create uh, uh, these generations. But a, a model for producing robots, not, not cyborgs. Exactly, exactly. And that is where the connection is, because here is a question when, if, uh, if we are operating in an environment, in a paradigm of the assembly line, dominated by this logic of the assembly line, by the logic of creating robots, when does a human stop being human? And here is my proposal is that when the human has been taught to completely forget that they have agency and to use their agency, when the human has you know, effects and purposes have been turned into an automaton for someone else's agency. Yeah. I would, I would entirely agree. I mean, I have, I have uh, you know, other thoughts about, about free will 
and and the idea that that free will is an illusion that that we are that we have you know biological impulses we have you know patterns inscribed upon us through language and and so that we don't nearly have as much free will as we think we do in the everyday but agency isn't connected to free will A- agency is is the the ability to um, make choices in the moment to be imperfect to, to overflow to, to, I love this concept of the overflow this is this is this is really great this is and 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 cyborgs overflow enormously this is one of the reasons why why I think sometimes cyborgs are objects of fear and and, and suspicion because they're overflowing in their humanity they've totally embraced the, me- the mechanic um, and, and and are not limited by these augmentations in any way see I'm thinking here do you know what I'm thinking of um, of uh, this Netflix series uh, Outered Carbon oh yes and see here you have an extreme example of uh, uh, actually a huge variety of different cyborgs on a, on a spectrum of cyborgs that we've talk, been talking about and uh, the main protagonist is swapping bodies as if yeah. they were so, machine parts. So humans have a have an implant at the base of the neck yeah. that records their memories and records their impulses and, and, and everything, all the sensory information in the body that generates is, is recorded on, I think it's called a stack. Yes, it's a stack. And uh, criminals, for example, uh, get, um, uh, they have their stacks removed and uh, other people get to use their bodies for a certain amount of time. So uh, one of the criminals who's the protagonist. It was a terrorist. Yeah. And uh, he, he goes on ice for like 300 years or something um, and then gets put into a, into a body and hired as a detective to sol- solve a murder mystery. And in real, that comes only with the destruction of the stack. Yes. Um, Whereas uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, even a criminal after serving their sentence uh, will, will receive a new body, which may or may not be uh, gender uh, appropriate. So if, if you had, uh, like in the movie, there is a moment where uh, the protagonist leaves jail and sees uh, other people who, who live in jail, right? And, uh, you know, someone um, who, who went to jail as a young, uh, young, young girl, girl or, yeah. thing, or young man. Yeah, uh, he's arriving as an, in an old woman's body. body yeah, right. so there's another interesting element in that series that people can be what's called spun up um, without a body, so they can be put into a VR rig, mm. so they don't actually have an organic presence. But there's an idea there that it is very difficult to create new memories and to actually live. Yes, without the the meat interface. Yeah, the the the, the meat. In this instance, is one of the sources for that overflow, and this is an interesting. This is like this is McLuhan on steroids. Right? This is hyper McLuhan, turbo hyper. Because what we're having here is this idea of the that uh, uh, media an extension of ourselves, and basically the body is the, the first medium. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. The body is the first medium, primary medium. Yeah, and 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 virtual reality isn't sufficient. Without the body, yes, as part of the machine, yes, that's beautiful. So the body is the first interface, and then you layer interfaces on top of it. That makes so much sense. Um, so, but I guess there's a trap there also in in that in that we are, you know, heading towards the the idea that at the end of the spectrum where there is no meat, we 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 potentially lose our ability to be human. As long as, uh, remember, if, if we agree that the overflow is what makes us human... As long as there's a capacity yes, for overflow, yes. yeah. Then, then yes. yes. But and this is, this is Moravec as well, right? You, yeah. you know, if you can download the, the complex patterns of humanity so that they can, they can continually generate in some sort of artificial system, you, you, you're just replacing one organic mechanical system for a, a non-organic, yeah. you know, silicon-based or quantum-based or whatever the, the situation is. Yeah, right. So I love this. So it's a, it's a spectrum that, that is moving from uh, an intensity of, of potential for overflow. Yeah. And, and being human. And being human. 
and then that or that originates not in a not in a kind of um, uh, definition of humanity at a genetic level, but humanity as a capacity f to communicate. And this is and be, and be being, being being being. So this is beautiful because we're getting we're solving the uh, ancient and solvable problem, right? Of what is it to be human by routing around it, right? That actually the problem is uh, the question that generates the problem is poorly asked uh, because you know you have a spectrum, right? And also what's interesting then is that the that one extreme of uh, uh, of the spectrum ends with uh, with the death of uh, the overflow, the death of being by uh, endless repetition of a pattern, right? So this is the, the assembly line, right? You're repeating a pattern. With no variation. Yeah. And variation is, again, yeah. a bug needs to be eliminated yes. from the system. So, so that, yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas on the other end, you have only variation. On the other end, you have chaos. So you have the two, yeah. And this is, the, the, you could, then we're making the argument, in effect, that the, the that extreme of the human, as opposed to the assembly line machinic, uh, and machinic not in the sense that of a machine because a machine can only be human in our, can also be human in our argument right mm -hmm. but uh, we're talking about the absence of variation the, 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 the um, constant sameness which is death right so the opposite of that mm -hmm. the opposite of that then is this uh, unbound uh, being right which, which overflows continuously is chaotic I love this is because it's a non-Marxist critique of the corporation, right? The corporation is a logical extension of the production line. Yes, and absolutely. You are you are expelling variation and chaos. Yes, variation and chaos is is the en enemy. It's 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 en entropy. Entropy yeah. to, to to the corporation, and 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 and. Um, this is why the, the university model and, and education model is relevant to the discussion about cyborgs because that's what we were talking about. It's the it's the expulsion of variation, of chaos. Chaos in the classroom is read as uh, the as the improperly formatting of the the human, yeah, as a as a as a subject of the production line, and. Uh, like you know, this is this is this is why it's beautiful when you see you know they're actually embracing chaos, even even in like art classes, right? You know, you know if it doesn't look a certain way, if it doesn't you know, if it doesn't resonate, if it's not creative, like it, it's amazing how we can reduce a concept like creative to a non-chaotic problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the brush, right? The pen is is one of the most important cyborg objects of, of humanity people talk about the printing press mm. but they forget about you know they forget about the ink and brush they forget about the pen the, the chiseling on the on the on the on the cave wall language yeah, yeah. language and it's just the my favorite example when because i, I have this conversation from time to time with people and i always make this argument that you know we're all cyborgs uh it's just you have a variation in the type of, of the flavor right uh or the word that we're using on the spectrum and you have usually people radically disagreeing, right? And having some sort of uh, uh, um, kind of pop culture informed uh, imagery for the cyborg. And a reimposition of yes. binary. Yes, and the binary. Always the binary, of course. And so I usually ask them, what about language? Right? It's, uh, if, if you look at language in and of itself as a system, it, it's hard to imagine anything more machinic than that. Right? Language is a machine for thinking. But it's a but it's a machine with an enormous capacity to overflow because because of yes of the way in which meaning works. Yes, yeah. this yes. is why I have a problem with the semiotic model. Right, it's that is it is not necessarily it's not necessarily an arbitrary relationship between the sign and the signifier. That there is actually how can it be arbitrary? <laughs> <laughs> but this is and this is why I mean you know, I fundamentally I'm looking forward to the new. Um, move the biopic about Tolkien coming out later this year. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. There's a biopic about Tolkien. I mean, I mean, obviously it's going to have problems as all biopics yeah. do. But I'm still really interested. Um, well, I uh, hope they don't. Spoil yeah, it. yeah, yeah. But is I mean, the son involved? I don't know. I haven't looked that far. I only saw the preview this week. But um, the thing about Tolkien and and why his world, 
just just is constantly overflowing is because he's a specialist in languages. You know, yes, it's, it's it's his training, oh, his background, yeah. and his fundamental understanding of how language works that resulted in this uh, in enormous overflowing world building that happened. You know, it was so big that you know he's got folios of notes and just endless variations of themes, and it wasn't even locked down. Like he had retellings of of these stories. I mean, you can you can make an argument that Tolkien studied all his life for for decades uh, with an absurd intensity in order to write five books. Yeah, uh, this is the Hobbit, the three Lord of the Rings uh, uh, books, and Silmarillion. Yeah, that's it. But what books? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> astonishing. Yeah, which yeah, which brings me to this. Um, it's kind of. Uh, Probably it feeds a little bit into uh, what we might be covering uh, down the track in uh, in uh, follow up uh, podcasts. But I'm really fascinated by this phenomenon of uh, uh, how, how towards the end of the 20th century, um, and again this tailors very nice. You can map it easily with uh, the rise of the industrial society, then in the information society, right? But they appeared to two massive tropes, and they appeared simultaneously. So you have first the appearance of uh, uh, the notion of the cybernetic organism, right, and the robot. And then you have the appearance of, and and the cybernetic organism, of course, percolates uh, across science fiction, which also maps to around the same time in its appearance and and as a popular genre and and, uh, uh, underpinning uh, large chunks of popular culture. And then you have the appearance of fantasy, Right in uh, first with Tolkien, and uh, Tolkien is is uh, the precursor. Right, he's the the originator. You had writers before who you could uh, uh, chalk up as, as the the you know the originators of fantasy, but Tolkien was the first uh, the, the ur writer. And then in the late seventies, early eighties, you have an explosion, yeah, which also coincides with the explosion in cyberpunk. And that, for me, has been very fascinating. It seems and, to me that and, there's a connection. And role-playing games. So and, also the explosion yes. of Dungeons and Dragons yes. as well. Yes. D&D, D&D goes directly hand-in-hand with the rising fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have this twin emergence of, of, of cyberpunk and fantasy spiraling around spiraling each Spiraling around. And I think that they are connected. Well, they cross over very clearly in the um, uh, FASA uh, world of Shadowrun. Shadowrun mm-hmm. is a Blade Runner type universe in which the elder beings, I'm not sure what they're called, uh, are reawakened. And humanity goes through this gen- enormous genetic shift and we start seeing the emergence of elves. And so people, so you know, literally families are giving birth to elves and dwarves and, and trolls and dragons reemerge out of their, their slumbering. And this is a, this, this did occur in the past in this world, and it's now. But there's also what, one of my favorite types of characters, the street samurai. So these are genetically augmented and cybernetically mm. augmented runners. Right? So this is also like in uh, Snow Crash, New Stevenson Snow Crash. The protagonist's name is... Uh, uh, hero, hero protagonist. protagonist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and he's a street samurai. Yeah. So this is... And that's this time, right? This is this time of... Um, Techno orientalism. Um, yeah, techno. So, and do you know what I think? I think that there is a there is some sort of deep uh, cultural current which connects this. They are like a helix, um, mm. which connects these two tropes. And the connection I suspect is the fact that it's as if technological advancement sort of lifted. Uh, you could you could metaphorize it as lifting a curtain, and all sorts of weird hybrids emerged. Mm. You know how Latour talks about hybrids, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but his hybrids are under the carpet, mine are behind a curtain. So he, you lift a curtain and you see all these weird hybrids yeah. and they're part technological, part mythological. Right? So myth suddenly appears. And I, I think there's also um, something to do with the increase in uh, global transport. So we, we start seeing more and more cultures mix in ways that weren't possible before because of you know air travel, 
the increased so um, you know ocean travel railways networks open up so there are more different types of cultures coming together uh, that create this kind of um, intermingling of, of races and cultures to create people who don't necessarily belong in one or the other that didn't I mean existed previously but didn't before um, you know you, you get a lot of this in America uh, in the post World War II era with you know kind of uh, African American Japanese people of Japanese descent so they, they exist in this and this, yeah. that's what hero protagonist is yeah you know he's a his father is. African American, and, and his mother, his mother is Japanese. Japanese. Yeah. yeah, and so he doesn't fit into the pre-established categories of these people in either world. But he excels in the VR space be- because he is already a yeah. cyborg. He, and this, this taps into Haraway a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. We're in Haraway in these these liminal figures, these 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 uh, these figures with enormous capacities to overflow. They are, by their very de- uh, definition, overflowing characters. But think think how nicely this all maps to a fantasy world in which you have the healer. Right? Let's say so. You have the um, all to a med- medieval world where you have the uh, you know you have the village and outside of the village always outside yeah. because it's a we're talking about heteroclite someone yeah. who transgresses boundaries yeah. you have and it's always a woman yeah. who is a healer and she's uh, um, you know she prepares concoctions she's a technological being right she knows about advanced chemistry and all sorts of other stuff right she knows how to heal bodies yeah. how to damage them um, she's surrounded by all sorts of weird technologies but she refuses to adhere to the, the rules yeah, she and, and, and logics of, of, the, the, of the community because she doesn't adopt the traditional roles. And insofar as the as you have this uh, organic appearance of this world, uh, you are um, you have some sort of coexistence developed because the village relies on her to to help and support, and she relies on the village. To, to be part of humanity. Yeah, right? yeah. And there's an exchange, right? There is an exchange. You know, there is an exchange. She's exchanging her knowledge and her abilities for sustenance, you know, so that she doesn't have to spend time out in the field. She can be working, gaining knowledge, talking to others. Let me give you a... a we are talking about language. Let yeah. me give you an interesting one. In Slavic languages, uh, the word for... So after Christianity came and obliterated the, this, this ancient world, uh, in basically introduced uniformity throughout. A factory line. Yes. So after Christianity came, the word for which in Slavic uh, uh, language, in, in Polish, in Russian, in, in different Slavic languages, is the same as a variation of this word, Vejma. Vejma, or, Vejma is Pol- in Polish, Vejma in uh, Russian. So check this out. Before Christianity, the word for a woman who knows how to heal and how to help was Vejma. Right. And it comes from the root Ved, the same as the Vedas in India, which is to know. Really? So th- yes. So this is the knower. The person who knows, for the, for the, the name for a man was Vedun, right? So the person who knows about stuff, who has that advanced knowledge, yeah. is, is that person over there, right? And the, when Christianity came, it shut this down. I'm going to, because we're, we're going to run out of time, but I'm going to swing this back to, to our conversation about students and and one of the interesting things about about students and and as as cyborg beings is the implicit understanding that they don't have to, and they get this in high school that, that or even in primary school really, they don't have to retain information. Yeah, they have to demonstrate the time. Near more than, but they're cyborg yeah. beings because they're aware of their ability to at any time search, search for that information. They have these tools yeah. and these technologies at their disposal, like the witch, mm. you know, that at any time they can draw on, like a tome, like a magic spell book. Yeah. Like the, this is the wizard in the in the like this is this is a very good point actually. Sorry, total tangent. In fantasy, particularly in D and D. The sorcerer is someone who can conjure magic from within, right? It's 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 internal. They tap yeah. into some sort of power. The cleric 
is uh, divine. They tap into the power of a god. Yeah. But the wizard, wizard has books, has books, yes, and they have it. to they have to memorize a spell. So they have to they have to. It's language. They have to transfer language from the spell book into their mind, and it's the it's actually the the the, the language, the runes that that, that that get transmogrified by the technology of the body to create the spell effect. And once having done the spell, they have to memorize it again. Again, yeah, because it's gone. Because yeah. it's gone. Like that, okay, well, that was a big... Okay, so let's, we need to do two things now. First, so after all of this, what's our title? Is it, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess? Or does it bother you that I'm not completely human? Or if the dolls also had mm. voices, they would have screamed, I didn't want to become human. I vote for Alita. Does it bother you that I'm not completely human? I Alita? agree. Yeah, I'm you agree? Think, okay, yeah, yeah. so we have Obviously. a title. And Excellent. the other thing I wanted to... Say so just to close and to, to kind yeah. of tie everything together, we have these two questions. So uh first is the question of what what is so if we have an idea what is a cyborg, what is a human in the age of machines, and we have we kind of answered it, it's uh, it's a cyborg and we have a spectrum, right? And the second question is what is the spectrum exactly and how did we define it? A capacity to overflow. A capacity to overflow with the one end being, which kind of represents the metaphorical death with the robotic repetition. Of the factory line. The factory line. And the other end being just this chaotic Pure, overflow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have it. We're done. There you go. Excellent. So, uh, thank you guys for listening. Absolutely. Uh, this was... Uh, This was a lot of fun to start. I had a lot of fun with this episode. Uh, I'm Chris Moore. You can find me on Twitter at CL underscore Moore. And uh, I'm Ted Mitu, And you can find me on Twitter at Ted Mitu. That's T-E-D-M-I-T-W. Thank you guys for listening. See you online.